Hi, I'm Kurt Fernley and welcome to One Plus One. Dr. Dinesh Palapana is one of the most unflappable people that you will ever meet, which makes him the perfect person to meet when you enter an ER on what could possibly be the worst day of your life. Dinesh is the second person in Australia to graduate medical school with quadriplegia. But he's forging his own path and showing that when committed and, and knowing where you need to get to, anything is possible. Dr. Dinesh Palapana, welcome to One Plus One. Kurt, thanks for having me. It's good to hang out with you again. Matt, we're here in the clinical setting and I find this terrifying, but I'm here because you're here and you make this place safe. Uh, why is it that the health system can be a scary experience? I love coming to work as a doctor. I work in the emergency department. It's every day when I'm at work, I uh, often take a minute to think about how lucky I am to be doing this job. Like, I love it. But I will not come to a hospital as a patient unless I am dying. That's an ironic thing, you know, it's not lost on me. That, that's, a, that's a paradox. But the reason for that is I was a patient for months and months and months when I had a spinal cord injury. And in those months, I felt so disempowered. I didn't have control of when I ate. I didn't have control of when I woke up. Um, I didn't have control of so many things. The environment itself is scary. There are alarms going off, there are people running around, there are critically ill people. So the environment itself is scary as well if you're new to it. And I think there's a, an element of um, paternalism as well. You know, you're told what your life should look like. You're told about many things. You're not often informed about what's going on. So all those things make it a scary experience to be a patient and I, I still hate it. Mm. When you come into this setting as a person with a disability, having experienced loss of agency before, do you think that exacerbates the, the fear, you know, as a person with a disability coming through those doors? Yeah, I think um, when you have a disability, all these things are made worse. And we saw that during the COVID-19 pandemic people with disability, particularly at the start of it, there were so many things that weren't thought about. You know, you and I rely on our wheelchairs, so uh, there wasn't much thought as to, okay, how do we manage this in an infection control environment? How do you manage this when a person has to be isolated, when there are people that need PPE to come into the room? How do we uh, best support someone who's reliant on lip reading when we're all wearing masks? All these things that they, they often weren't thought about and it took a while for the broader community to adapt. And there were more scary things that happened as well, like uh, some people with disability in some parts of the world were deprioritized from accessing life-saving healthcare like ventilators or intensive care. And this was really, really confronting to see. But even now, I think when you have a disability, often uh, it, it's a, you're vulnerable to more, many things. And the data shows that in, uh, whether it be a hospital setting or uh, certain care settings, people with disability experience all sorts of violence, like sexual violence even. And in my own experiences, um, I had experiences where it was borderline. Well, it's questionable whether it was sexual abuse. Uh, and many of the young male colleagues, when I was going through certain rehab experiences, we shared some really difficult experiences. So if you're a person with a disability navigating the system, I think it becomes all the more difficult for so many reasons. We don't talk about that. You know, we don't talk about the, um, the, the people with disabilities that come through through the rehabilitation process and the, the dehumanisation of that and the potential for abuse. But we can talk about that, right? Like this is why we do the show, is that me and you can have that honest conversation about, about that. So can you expand that experience when you are dehumanised and you know, borderline assaulted or sexually assaulted? Yeah, I mean, you and I have a voice, right? Like 
but there, there are so many people that don't have a voice. And there are so many people, like when you say, when you bring in intersections, like if there's a language barrier or if there's a cultural barrier or if, if someone has an intellectual disability and you don't know what is happening. So that there are these intersections that again, make things worse as well. And there are so many people that don't have a voice uh, that might be too scared to speak because you are under a system and you feel like you're dependent on the system for a certain extent. So um, even for me, uh, I'm now a part of the medical hierarchy, right? There are people who are senior to me um, and in medicine in particular, the, this hierarchy people can be responsible for your career, responsible for the way it goes forward. So it's still a risk for even me to speak out. But I think we have to have these conversations. I think we have to speak out. I think we have to talk about it. So otherwise these problems just keep going and get swept under the rug. But I can tell you for sure that it was such a dehumanizing experience. Even when we went to the bathroom some mornings, it wasn't clean, you know, and there was just human waste everywhere. How can you put someone through that when we're living in a country like Australia in particular, you know, where we have the resources to allow people to live with dignity. I just, uh, I hope by having these conversations that we can change that, but um, I hope that we can give people the courage and encourage people to come out and share their stories because stories are really important. Do you think understanding the vulnerability of the loss of agency is also important? Is that understood? Like, and I just see that your impact in here is just so, like it's tied to changing that. I don't know if that's understood. And I, I don't know sometimes whether that's even taken advantage of. I spent many nights alone in the hospital when there was no one around. And there were some nights when people came in and started, started touching my leg or whatever, and there's no one around, I can't yell out. and. When you're going through such a tough situation as well, like coming to terms with the spinal cord injury, I didn't even know what was happening. Like I was like, I don't, I don't know what's going on. I don't, there's so many issues happening. So there, that, that level of vulnerability, um, I think, I just don't know if it's understood. And I don't know, I sometimes think that's, you know, it's probably taken advantage of to a certain extent as well. How did you find your way out? You have no choice. For me, I think one of the things is hope. You know, hope is so important. And again, I think hope is something that we're quick to take away in the health system from people. Uh, hope, actually, I think as a society, sometimes we're quick to crush hope. Hope is important. Hope for a better tomorrow. Hope that everything will be okay. Hope that life will keep going in some meaningful way. So I think. Hope was really important for me and my family to keep moving along. Before your accident, you were already in the medical system. Why? I am not one of those people that grew up wanting to be a doctor. I had no idea what I wanted to do uh, and I had no purpose, so I decided to become a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that's what I did when I finished high school. I became a lawyer. Oh, I went to law school at least. And when I was in law school, I became depressed. And I think this is another important conversation for our society, right? Mental health, uh, because we need to deal with it better. I developed an anxiety disorder. I developed a panic disorder. I developed agoraphobia where eventually I was too afraid to go outside the house. It, times were dark. I was scared all the time. I was just like a ghost floating through the world. So I started to see a doctor. And then I emerged from the depression. And I remember the very day I realized, oh my gosh, I might, I might be okay now. And that's a feeling that you want to hold on to so tight because you, you don't want to go back to that place where I'm like, oh my God, I don't, I, don't want to, I don't want to feel that way again. This is so good. And it was a day I drove out of the garage and suddenly I could feel the sun on my skin. I could see the colors of the trees. It was so green and beautiful. I could hear the music coming out of my car. I, I, was, I felt alive again. So 
I realized, and this is something else that my mom loves to say, which is by helping one person, you might not change the world, but you'll change the world for them. So I realized that my doctor changed my world and that sat with me uh, in such a profound way that I just want to be a doctor after that. It's like, I want to do this for people. I want to do something because there's a purity in that I felt, you know, like being with a person face to face, doing something and helping them get through something. It was so powerful. So that's how I got into medicine. And that's, uh, I just wanted to be in the business of changing worlds. Can you tell me about the night in 2010 when you did have an accident and find your pathway to disability? Yeah, I'm gonna say finding the path to disability, that's, you know, that, that actually makes me think because before that night, I had no idea what disability is, what life is like for someone with a disability. I had no idea. I had zero concept of, you know, I would have, might have seen someone in a wheelchair and I would have thought, wow, that must be hard. Uh, but it was almost confronting, you know, where you, where you don't want to think about it anymore. But then that night, 31st of January, 2010, I was driving home from visiting my parents' place. I ended up on a stretch of highway that uh, there was roadworks happening uh, earlier and it was, it was a night, so the road wasn't in perfect condition, I don't think. And it was very dark because there was no lighting. Uh, and I came up to this stretch of road where I, I drove up to this black shiny bit on the road. Like it, it might've been a puddle or it might've been some oil, I don't know. But as soon as I drove over it, cause it was too late to avoid it, my car started sliding all over the road. Then it had a rollover and the rollover was actually nose to tail, which was a pretty weird way to crash. But then when the car landed, I tried to get out and I couldn't. I tried to grab the door handle and my fingers weren't working. And then I realized that I couldn't feel anything below the chest and that I couldn't move my body. So I knew, I knew what had happened. How were you greeted then? In those moments that followed, I think I learned the most important lesson about being a doctor in medicine, actually being about being a human being. Uh, I was cut out of the car by uh, some firemen, which uh, interestingly, their truck actually lost control as well when they approached the scene. But I was uh, put into the ambulance and when I look up in the ambulance, I see a doctor who had given me a lecture not long before that. You know, out of the many months that I subsequently had as a patient, in those few minutes in the ambulance, I think this doctor left the strongest impact on me. He told me that uh, I'll be okay. He told me that uh, I'd find a way back to medicine. He told me that life was gonna be okay and I would get through it. And he told me that he was looking after me and he was taken to the best place that deals with these injuries. So what he taught me that night is that, uh, as they say, people may not remember what you do for them, but they will always remember how you make them feel. Mm. Because I don't remember any of the technical things that he did for me, but I remember how he made me feel. That's really the most important part, right? Whether we're talking about disability or humanity or medicine or whatever it might be, it's about how we treat our fellow human and it's about how we make them feel. Uh, and I think that that's really where we sometimes, you know, where we go wrong in this conversation about disability and inclusion, because we make people feel disabled. Mm. I find that remarkable. Like you started your life as a person with a disability with hope. Like even people, like I know that my mum, um, when I was brought into the world, I was brought into the world with an apology. The, 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 the doctors, the nurses, the clinicians, they all said, I'm so sorry. But you were welcomed in it 
with hope. And I, and I just, I can't get, like, I find that moment just so powerful. Wow. I never, I never thought about it like that. And that is, that's actually really eye-opening that uh, you're brought into the world with an apology. I mean, we, we've seen comments like that lately, right, o across the world. But yes, you know, in those moments, he actually never made me feel any less. He never made me feel like life was, life was grim. He actually gave me hope in those moments. And actually, that's probably, it's probably the torch that carried me through. But what you just told me was, uh, I've never thought about that. It's really quite a, quite a contrast. When you are out of rehab, of all the pathways to go down, why, why did you want to be a doctor in the ER? I was always interested in it. Like when I was going through medical school, it's something that I loved. Actually, partly because of the doctor that I just told you about. He gave me the first lecture about emergency uh, medicine and working in the emergency department. And I thought, wow, this looks like a really cool job. So when I came back and once I graduated from medical school, I was thinking about what to do. And I remember one night I was uh, working in the kids emergency department. And we have this amazing doctor that works there. And she sat down and she was talking to me after my shift and she said, what do you want to do with your career? And I said, you know, I'll, I'll have a few thoughts about what I want to do, um, but I really enjoy doing this uh, because I get to see so many patients that are going through a hard time. Uh, I get to make a difference for them when, when it really matters. And, um, but after the spinal cord injury, I just wasn't sure if this would work. And then she just said, why not? <laughs> why can't it work? Like, we can make it work. Let's make it work. So from that point on, I've just been working in the emergency department and actually it works. The thing I've learned is that a lot of the barriers that we have are in our own heads. And a lot of the barriers are in society's head. And disability can be hard, but it should never be too hard, right? No. Uh, uh, tell me about how the, the nuts and bolts of your role in an ER People think that, for example, right, one conversation that I had when I was coming back to medical school is about CPR, performing compressions on a person, whether I can do it. But then we realize, do I actually need to do it? Because in the ED, um, doctors don't often perform compressions, right? It, that we have a whole heap of other staff. Um, and these days, we're actually using automated machines that do the compressions for us. So a doctor's job is actually to sit back and cognitively problem solve and to figure out why is this person having a cardiac arrest and how do we fix it? 95% of the patients, uh, many patients that come through the e ER don't need physical things. You know, a lot of them might be having chest pain or a heart attack or a stroke or whatever. Our job is to cognitively think through the problem, diagnose it, medications, whatever. So actually, most patients don't need anything hands-on. I've been really lucky to have a set of senior colleagues that have, um, that have seen the value in it and that have seen my place in it and that have empowered and enabled me to be there. And they've really gone to fight for me early in my career. They've stood up for me. Um, when it came time to get a job and when I was struggling with the health system. Well, some... who were they fighting? That's like, who, what was the barrier that they had to fight against for you to get a job? The system, right? It's the system. system. So um, the health system were like, okay, how, you know, how, do, how do we have this guy with the spinal cord injury be a doctor? How do we do this? How do we do that? Uh, and I came across, I've come across so many conversations like that where, there have been people that have never met me, that have never seen me work, that have never seen me do things, um, who from afar have made decisions about what I can and can't do. That's incredibly frustrating. You know, at least talk to the people that have seen me work, that have seen me, that know me, talk to me, meet me. 
but they, they think, okay, disability, spinal cord injury, no, that's not going to work. Um, what a judgment that is <laughs> to make, right? So a lot, a lot of my colleagues, my senior colleagues, some of them even said, look, we've seen him work. We know how he works. We know that it works. Talk to us. Um, and some of them actually, some of them put up their own salaries. They said, we'll even take money off the table. He can take part of our salary to fund his. So they really took a bet on me. And I think that's one of the other things that's really important, right? For us to fight for each other, um, for us to fight to have allies, I think it's really important. Because often it's a matter of these systems, whether it be the health system or the legal system or whatever. And what we fail to realize is that those systems are actually accountable to us and we have the power to shape and change it. So if we see something happening that's not right, we need to stand up and fight. But sometimes our voice isn't heard. So that's when we need the advocate, the ally, the, the person who is, who seems to be valued or their voice seems to be valued more. When you got through the, the barriers and the incredible support that you got through the education system to become a doctor, how have you found the response of the, the person on the ground, you know, the patient when they see you? I love that question because I remember having this conversation with a doctor who was one of my supervisors before I came back to medical school. And they said, I don't know if patients will take you seriously. You know, I don't know. Um, and then I thought about it as well. I'm like, oh man, like, <laughs> will they? Like, what, 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 how are they gonna respond when I turn up to their bedside on a wheelchair? Yeah. What are they gonna think? So uh, now I've seen thousands of patients, right? Not one, not one, uh, which amazes even me actually. Uh, not one has ever said, can you do your job because you're in a wheelchair? Can you look after me safely because you never, not one. They might have had thoughts in the back of their head, I don't know, but no one has responded that way to me. So for society, I think we need to give them a bit more credit as well because most of the resistance came from the system, yeah. not from the people. Your journey is a remarkable one. It, it, it doesn't start with your experiences as a ER doctor, it starts a long time before that. Uh, can you tell me about growing up in Sri Lanka? Sri Lanka has been through so many challenging times. It's, it's actually still going through some pretty harrowing um, moments for people. But when I was a kid there, um, it was going through a war. And it was going through an ethnic war two different peoples fighting for political power, land, whatever else. And then in amongst that, there was a political war as well. There was a political uprising. And, you know, I, I often take stock, like you and me are here having a conversation in Australia, such a diverse country, right? There are diverse political opinions, there's diverse ethnicities, there's so much diversity and we all live here prosperously happily, right? I, I mean, I know we got our issues, but when I was growing up, that wasn't the case. People were killing each other. Hundreds of thousands of people died because they saw their differences. It was confronting. I had a happy childhood because I had, my mom always protected me from all that, but I still saw death. I remember seeing people burnt alive in piles of tires. I remember people being beheaded, being shot, being blown up. I remember seeing death at a very young age uh, and corruption and poverty. And again, these are things that people don't like to talk about often, but it happened mm. and people suffered and people died. And, you know, I, th I think for the wealthy, it's not as big an issue, but the people that suffer the most in these situations are the poor the guy who doesn't have anything to eat, the mum who can't keep her kids warm. And uh, these people never had a voice and they suffered and that's what I grew up in. How do you process that trauma as a kid? Like it's gotta leave, a, it's gotta leave an impact on you, right? It's left an impact on me, but I think um, my mum my in particular, she always, 
She always protected me. She was so strong, right? She's such a resilient, strong person. She was always moving us forward. So I think I, I was lucky to have that shield. One of my friends says that she's like uh, Captain America's shield. <laughs> <laughs> I also went back to Sri Lanka after I had the spinal cord injury. There is no NDIS. There are no job opportunities. There's no health care for these people. And many, many people who got discharged from the spinal unit go home and die. Because there's nothing, right? There's, there's no, there's nothing. So I just think about how lucky I am. I think about how fortunate I am. I think about how good my life is to be having a conversation with Kurt Fernley. <laughs> He's overrated. He's a <laughs> <laughs> but you know, like I, I, I'm here having a conversation with you about how to make, how to make the world better for people with disability. You know, like we're, like how lucky am I? So that's that's the one thing that it's given me. I think rather than um, it's just given me a sense of gratitude for this life. Tell me about the importance of a couple of words, carpe diem. I try to seize the most of life, especially today, because I'm so painfully aware of how fleeting life is. I never expected to have a car accident. I never expected to have this life, but within seconds, a slippery road gave this to me. Uh, and my life changed within seconds, right? But every single day when I'm at work, every single day, Kurt, like we, we you know, all through my shift, I hear uh, a buzzer go off. It's an alarm. And it says that there's someone in the resuscitation room needing resuscitation. And all these people rush to that room to try and keep these people alive. And there are many of those people that will have a stroke or a heart attack or a trauma that will change their life forever in those moments. And I often wonder, what did they think when they wake up in the morning? Did they make the most of their day? Did they hug their loved ones? Did they make the most of life up to that point? I wonder that, because some, some of these people sadly don't make it. The very last thing I did uh, standing up was to hug my mom. I gave her this big bear hug and I uh, got into my car and left. And even before then, I tried to make the most of life. You know, I took this spur of the moment trip a few weeks before the accident with one of my best friends. And we went to Japan and we did all this stuff. And I think I'm so happy that I seized life then because if I died that day, I would have done everything and I would have lived a full life. And even today, I think I have all these opportunities, right? I get to work, I get to have a voice, I get to do things, and I want to squeeze every bit out of life. Not just for me, but for every other person, and for every other person that is across in the other side of the world, where I was born, for example, that will never have the opportunities that I do. So uh, I've got to seize the day, carpe diem. Well, Dr. Dinesh Palapana, thanks for joining me on One Plus One. Kurt, you are amazing. Uh, I think the world of you and uh, thank you for what you've done for our community. And thanks for uh, letting me share some time with you today. I don't deal well with compliments, so we, <laughs> we might have to cut that out. <laughs>